This morning's reading comes from Mark chapter 14, verses 1 to 11. Now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. While he was in Bethany reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, and a woman, a woman came with an alzheimer jar, a very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more, for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her hastily. Leave her alone, Jesus said. Why are you bothered, bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor will always be with you, and you can help them at any time you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured the perfume on her body, before, body beforehand and prepared for my burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to, opportunity to hand him over. This is the word of the Lord. Well, we're in uh, Lent again, and it, it's a question that probably I have to ask myself more than what you do, but where do you begin this journey? Uh, it's, it's a journey where we're meant to be ready to encounter Jesus, uh, contemplate the depths of the significance of his uh, death and resurrection for us. Where do you kind of begin this journey? And we've decided this year to kick it off with this little unit. It, it, there's a story like this that turns up in each of the four Gospels. Um, it's about a woman who anoints Jesus. Now, just to kind of clarify, there are actually two versions of this story. Uh, there is one that's in Luke's Gospel, and it's Mary Magdalene. Uh, this happens early in Jesus' ministry, in the first uh, year or so. It's in the north, um, it's in Galilee, it's at the house of a Pharisee and Mary Magdalene is a woman uh, who has a sinful reputation and she comes and she anoints Jesus with an alabaster jar of expensive perfume and the Pharisee says, if you were any kind of a prophet, you would know who this woman was and the fact that she is tainted and she's making you unclean and you wouldn't let her do this. And Jesus' response is, the person who has been forgiven much is overwhelmed. And, and she's giving out of the appreciation of forgiveness that she understands. Uh, and, and she gets it and you don't. This is not that story. This is an unknown woman on the Wednesday in the last week of Jesus' life. We're in Jerusalem. Well, technically, we're in Bethany, which is about three k's or so away from Jerusalem. But Jesus is down in the south in what we might call Holy Week. So let us set the scene. Uh, 
Jerusalem normally has a population of about 50,000 people. And come Passover, another 200,000 zealous Jews come to town to celebrate the Passover. This is the big festival in the Jewish calendar. And it's not just um, we go to church and then there's a big rello bash afterwards, like our Christmas, right? This is a religious festival. It's the time where Israel is remembering and celebrating the power of God to free his people from the ungodly Gentile overlords. And you can imagine that that's going to stir up some religious revolutionary fervor. In fact, riots would often happen at this very time. One year, 30,000 people die at Passover time. And the Romans know this, so they bring in extra garrisons who are camped in the temple. It's the Wednesday. We've already had the triumphal entry where Jesus has uh, come down the Mount of Olives through the Garden of Gethsemane, walked along the Kidron Valley, and the multitudes are there. These 200,000 people who've come to town, tens of thousands of them would have come from Galilee. They would have seen Jesus perform miracles. They would have been the recipients of the bread and the fish. Uh, the expectation that there's a Messiah, that something's about to give, and the Passover is the perfect moment for some kind of revelation of God. And so they're praising God, they're laying down their coats and the branches. And then Jesus goes from there to the temple and overthrows the tables of the money changers. And this just kind of embeds the hatred that the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, the Sadducees, the chief priests have for Jesus. I mean, they've been offside for ages. Jesus has been talking about how they are like wicked tenants. Uh, and um, they want to kill Jesus, but now the intensity of that is also growing. And they'd love to do it this week, but they can't because there's so many people in town and some of them are supporters. And so there's kind of all this tension on both sides. Something's got to give. And now we're a little way out of town because 200,000 people can't all stay in Jerusalem. So Jesus is staying in Bethany. It's a short walk away, you know, three Ks, maybe half an hour or whatever. Um, and he's at the house of Simon the leper. And at this festival that they're having, at this celebration, there are men and women. Now, this is not unusual. There are often women at Jesus' events. All right, this is from the Gospel of uh, Luke. Jesus travels from one place to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. The twelve are with him, and some women. So, uh, it's not unusual for women to be present, and we learn some of their names. Joanna, Susanna, Mary. Uh, there will be others. Mary, Salome. Um, there are a number of disciples, not the twelve disciples, but the outer ring beyond that, from whom Matthias was chosen. A number of these disciples are women. And so in today's passage, Jesus is at Bethany at the home of Simon the leper. Who's Simon the leper? Mark seems to think it's important we actually know his name. We've never met him before. He can't have leprosy now because if Jesus is staying at the house of a leper, then he's unclean. He can't wander down to the temple. So presumably he was previously a leper and the nickname has kind of stuck. How do you lose leprosy in the first century? It's pretty rare. It's possible, even probable, he's been healed by Jesus at some point in time. He's probably also reasonably well off. 
because he owns a big enough house to have guests come and stay and he's hosting some or other type of a party. Because while Jesus is at Bethany, he's reclining. Now, you sit for a normal meal, but if you're going to have a party, you recline. Because a party goes on for longer and you've kind of laid back and there's servants, right? This is how it works in the first century. And what you're also meant to do is, if the party is celebrating a special guest, then the host would anoint the special guest with oil. Except Simon the leper doesn't do that. It's some woman, an unnamed woman who comes with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume and she broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. So just imagine you're there in the room. There's a number of people, men, women, Jesus' disciples, and here comes a woman and she breaks open a jar. And that's significant because once the seal is broken, you've got to use all of the perfume. Right? It's a little bit like, say, a bottle of Grange. You open a bottle of Grange and, well, you've got to drink it all because it's not going to be as good the next day. Right? You can't put the lid back on and then put it on eBay and try and sell it. It doesn't work that way. So here is a bottle of fine perfume that we're told is worth more than a year's wages. What's that? 60, 70, 80 thousand dollars? Tens of thousands of dollars of perfume is poured in a room full of people and the aromas are just going to permeate everywhere. Everybody's going to notice. What the heck is this woman doing? For breaking open what is probably her family's life savings. $60,000, $80,000 worth of money is, is no small amount in the first century. And she pours all of it over in Matthew and Mark's gospel, Jesus' head, and in John's gospel, Jesus' feet. This is extravagant. And what's going to happen? Tomorrow, Jesus is going to have a shower and it's all gone. What a waste that was. If anything, it is stupendously, recklessly generous. And everybody's looking and chatting and talking, what the heck has this woman done? Some of those present were indignantly saying to one another, notice that some, it's not just Judas. I think in our memories, we imagine that it's Judas who leads the charge here, right? Because he's the one who's greeting. But there's a number of people who are saying, why this waste? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And if we go back to the law of Moses, you have a responsibility for the poor. You are supposed to provide. You want to be wasteful and reckless with your possessions because God blesses all of Israel. And Jesus talks in the Sermon on the Mount, for instance, not about if, but when you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Right? So there's this biblical presupposition that you should be caring for the poor. Like, so in some ways, I'm kind of with the disciples, right? If Marianne said to me, oh, we've got a special guest coming, what about if we blow an $80,000 bottle of wine? <laughs> that would be wasteful.
so those present rebuke her harshly. Can you just imagine the men almost ganging up on her like a pack of wolves and condemning the recklessness of what it is that she has just done. Now, this picture is kind of unhelpful because it portrays the disciples as in their mid-30s or 40s or something. They're not. We know from the New Testament that, with the exception of Peter, the disciples are teenagers. They don't have to pay the temple tax, which is why Peter only needs to find two coins for the temple tax, one for himself and one for Jesus, who's about 33 or 4 at this stage. But all the others are underage. They're teenagers. So there's these teenage disciples who have decided that this older woman, probably a woman of some means and of some life experience, who has been able to accumulate some wealth such that she's probably one of the funders of Jesus, right? They're condemning her. They're telling her off. And Jesus says, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing for me. There's a group attacking. There's a single female who in that and in perhaps any culture is feeling vulnerable and Jesus defends her. And he defends her because she's understood something. She's got something profoundly right that those who are condemning her have missed and misunderstand. Jesus has been saying for some time, I'm going to die. And the disciples say, no, you won't, Jesus. We will defend you. We will take out the sword. They're not listening. They don't get it. And here is an unnamed woman preparing Jesus for his death. She's there probably because she's one of the wider groups of disciples. And maybe she's been listening. Maybe she's understood. Maybe her female intuition has kicked in and somehow she senses that this is the appropriate thing to do. To what extent she fully understands, I think that's an overstatement. But I think we can say she understands at a level beyond what the 12 male disciples do. And she does something that Jesus describes as beautiful. And it's a pattern that Mark and Luke are both saying is repeated. We have a woman preparing Jesus for his death. And then we have, when Jesus is crucified, the women also preparing his body for the grave. Now, you no doubt have heard that and you've probably thought to yourself... Well, maybe spices and oils and whatever else is women's work. It's not. In the first century, it's men's work. It's a male's job to prepare their father for the grave. And when John the Baptist dies, his male disciples prepare his body for the grave. So where are Jesus' male disciples when he dies? They're missing in action. It's the women who are there. It's the women who get it. It's the women who get the resurrection before the male disciples do. And 
And then Jesus makes this other odd comment. Not only are you kind of judging her, but your comment in reference to the poor, well, the poor you will always have with you. And you can help them anytime you want. But you won't always have me. Now, for our 21st century ears, this is an ambiguous statement. Right? It could be interpreted one of two ways. There will always be poor people. Poverty is a structural reality that we can't ever prevent. And if you wanted to be a little harsh, trying to solve structural poverty is a black hole. And you can pour an awful lot of money in that hole and you never ever fill it. And there will be people who would argue that Jesus is saying something like that. A different reading would be to say what Jesus is saying is something like, you will always have the poor amongst you. Because you are caring for the poor, and so the poor will be drawn to you. And that sounds like what Jesus is saying in the Sermon on the Mount. It looks like Jesus feeding the 5,000. It looks like the early church. It looks like the church in the book of Acts. And so I take it this second reading is preferable, and Jesus' point is not that you will or you won't be caring for the poor. You ought to be caring for the poor, but in this particular instance, something unique is happening. And this woman has understood that a reckless generosity is not misplaced but very timely, because I'm with you now. I won't always be, but I'm with you now. And she is preparing me for my death. So let's pull this together. Just let this, let you feel this wash over you, the words of, imagine you're one of those critiquing others who's at the party and Jesus says this, leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She's done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want, but you won't always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare me for my burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. I read one commentary this week that suggested that these words of Jesus are the highest praise he has for any individual anywhere recorded in the Gospels. A vulnerable female feeling like the men are ganging up on her and Jesus vindicates her and says something beautiful about her. And it's not just Jesus. Wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Let me tell you what that doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that whenever we preach through the gospel of Matthew or Mark and we come to this particular passage, we'll actually talk about this story. Granted, that's what's happening but that is not what Jesus means in the first instance, partially because the Gospels actually haven't been written yet. There's no such thing as a Gospel of Mark. Or What Jesus means is, in the days, weeks, months, and years to come, when people are sitting around fires or dinner tables, or they're walking and they're retelling the story like happens on the road to Emmaus, part of the story of Jesus 
will include the story of a woman who recklessly with abandon anoints Jesus in preparation for his death and gets what nobody else yet understands. A nameless woman whose story will be retold. And for those of us who try and make a name for ourselves, by attaching our name to some great achievement or something, we hear that a nameless woman who doesn't self-randise herself but attaches her story to the story of Jesus. This nameless woman, her story is gone. Then we get this fascinating little twist at the end where Mark attaches Judas. Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. And I think what Mark is setting up is a contrast. Here we have an unnamed woman who's a little bit on the outer, who has heard and understood Jesus' ministry, Jesus' calling, and she responds in a way that others will condemn but is unbelievably generous, tens of thousands of dollars generous, giving up her life savings, her everything generous, because you can't sell your house in those days, right? It doesn't belong to you. All of her worldly goods that she can dispose of, she just pours onto Jesus in a way that she can never get them back. And she does that and in the process is preparing Jesus for his death. And contrast that with Judas, who is also preparing Jesus for his death by betraying him for 30 pieces of silver, which is worth something like $500. A disciple whose name we know, who's in the inner circle. The contrast could not be more stark, could it? And the person who gets it is not the person we expect. You see, when you have an encounter with Jesus, like this unnamed woman does, and like Judas does, one of two things is going to happen. Either it will become increasingly clear to you who Jesus is and what matters in life and that Jesus is worthy of your worship. Or it will become increasingly clear to you that actually your hope is in something else. And you'll trade Jesus for a few pieces of silver. Why priceless? waste. If we go back to the story of 
Mary Magdalene. She's a spirit-possessed, evil woman with a reputation. And Jesus says to the Pharisee, she's been forgiven much. Of course she's generous with much. But there is no sense that our unnamed woman is motivated because of something particularly special that Jesus has done for her. Her reckless, abandoning love for Jesus is because she gets that Jesus loves the world and that he came for the world and she is merely just a part of the world and she's responding after no particular singled out interaction with her and Jesus and that makes her response all the more remarkable So, Lent is a season where we put things aside and we clear the decks, preparing for an encounter with Jesus. Are you ready to meet Jesus again? this Lent. A Jesus who loves the world and you're just a part of the world that he loves and yet when you get that it can bring a clarity and a single-minded response. It just draws that out of you in an intuitive way that, that other people will think is foolish and not understand and possibly even condemn. But that is the right response to Jesus. We come to you, Jesus, in the midst of not uncluttered, but overwhelmingly cluttered lives. Perhaps we feel neither like Judas nor this unnamed woman. Perhaps we feel like we haven't even got time to try and engage with you this Lent. Well, that's not an option. That's actually on the Judas side of the ledger. Jesus, what you have done for us is world-changing. And when we get it, it invokes inside of us a response that wants to give you everything. Help us this Lent season to encounter you and to understand you in your fullness, in your love, in your compassion, in your glory and to respond in appropriate ways like we have seen from an unnamed woman.